The FBI is one of the most prestigious and respected law enforcement agencies in the world. Its agents are trained to uphold the highest standards of professionalism, integrity, and accountability. However, not all FBI agents live up to these ideals. Some of them have been involved in crimes such as corruption, fraud, abuse of power, and even murder. In this video, we will explore some of the cases where FBI agents were sentenced for their actions and how they reacted. Ruben Manuel Hernandez. Ruben Manuel Hernandez was visibly emotional when he heard his sentence, and his story is a very disturbing one. He was once a dedicated FBI agent, but his life took a dramatic and unfortunate turn when he opened fire on a Grand Rapids police officer during what was later described as a moment of extreme paranoia. As a consequence of his actions, he was subjected to legal proceedings and was ultimately sentenced to a combination of jail time and probation by Kent County Circuit Court Judge Dennis B. Lieber. The judge, while passing the sentence, characterized the incident as a tragic circumstance. Anytime anyone takes a shot at any police officer, being locked up is a reality. Judge Lieber's decision to impose jail time came as a surprise to many, especially considering the recommendation made by the Kent County Prosecutor's Office during a plea hearing held in February 2017. In that hearing, the Prosecutor's Office had suggested that Ruben Manuel Hernandez should not serve any jail time for the charge of assault with a dangerous weapon. However, Judge Lieber explained his rationale, stating, I could not in good conscience follow the prosecutor's recommendation of no jail. In an interesting twist, Hernandez had the opportunity to withdraw his plea and opt for a trial, but he chose not to go down that path. Instead, he expressed a strong desire to put this challenging chapter of his life behind him. During his exchange with the judge, he candidly revealed, I'm just tired, sir. I'm tired of being tired. I just want to move on with my life. Me and my family want to move on and put this behind us and rebuild our lives. Consequently, Judge Lieber decided to sentence Hernandez to 135 days in jail, granting him credit for one day already served. Additionally, the judge placed Hernandez on probation for a a period of two years. You're a man who lived an exemplary life up until the day this incident occurred, Lieber said. And once the horror of your actions were revealed to you, I believe the contrition and remorse that you expressed is heartfelt and sincere. According to sentencing guidelines, the recommended jail term for the case could have been as long as six months. Defense attorney Larry C. Willie advocated for the most lenient end of the guideline spectrum. During the court proceedings, Willie emphasized the absence of injuries or harm during the incident, expressing gratitude that no one had been hurt. Hurt. He commended the Grand Rapids Police Department for their exceptional restraint and skill, which ultimately prevented any harm from befalling Mr. Hernandez. There is something to be thankful for here. No one was injured. No one was hurt, Willie said. The Grand Rapids Police Department showed a good deal of restraint and skill that resulted in Mr. Hernandez himself not being injured. Willie also said his client did not aim at police when he opened fire, a point that led to a significant disagreement in the courtroom. However, the prosecution presented a contrasting viewpoint, disputing the defense's claim. Kent County Assistant Prosecutor Kimberly A. Richardson argued that Hernandez had indeed aimed his weapon at the police officer. He said, it is our position that he did aim at the officer. It's worth noting that Hernandez's presence in Michigan was for a specific investigative assignment that began on December 5th. He was scheduled to return to Nevada just two days later, on December 7th. It came to light that he had consumed alcohol before the shooting incident. The situation unfolded at Planet Fitness, located at 3681 28th Street SE, in the early hours of December 6th. Multiple concerned citizens had dialed 911 to report a man brandishing a firearm inside the fitness center. Hernandez fired three shots before being apprehended in a parking lot near the intersection of 28th Street and East Beltline Avenue SE. This arrest was captured on video by the police, adding a layer of transparency to the unfolding events Larry C. Willie had earlier asserted that Ruben Manuel Hernandez was in the midst of a paranoid kind of fit when he discharged a handgun at Grand Rapids Police Sergeant Neil Gomez. This alarming incident unfolded at a considerable distance, approximately 30 to 35 yards apart. Hernandez had an impressive tenure as an FBI agent and was an eight-year veteran at the time. He had a spotless, professional record throughout his career. However, this incident led to his arraignment on two serious assault charges, one of which was the gravely consequential charge of assault with intent to commit great bodily harm, a felony carrying a potential 10-year sentence. In a legal maneuver that significantly reduced the potential consequences, Hernandez opted to enter a no-contest plea to a charge of assault with a dangerous weapon. 
This offense carried a more lenient four-year sentence. As part of the negotiated plea agreement, the prosecution agreed to drop the weightier charge, along with a misdemeanor count related to the public brandishing of a firearm. The repercussions of this incident extended beyond the courtroom. Hernandez lost his position as an FBI agent in Las Vegas, marking a significant personal and professional setback. Despite this setback, Judge Lieber expressed a willingness to permit Hernandez to fulfill his probationary period in Nevada once his jail sentence is over. This consideration provides a glimmer of hope for Hernandez as he navigates the legal and personal fallout of his actions. Chase Bishop. That's Chase Bishop looking relieved after he just learned that he wouldn't be going to jail for his crimes. Chase Bishop's story is one that captured the attention of many people, as it involved a mix of intrigue, humor, and horror rolled up into one big event. It all started on a night when Bishop, who was an FBI agent, was off duty and enjoying himself at a Denver bar. The bar, called Mile High Spirits and Distillery, was hosting a lively dance party on June 2nd, and Bishop joined in with the crowd. He was having a good time until he decided to do something that would change his life forever. He attempted a backflip. This risky move proved to be a bad idea, as Bishop's handgun, which he had concealed in a holster, slipped out of its place and fell to the ground. When he landed his backflip, he tried to pick up his gun and accidentally caused the gun to fire a bullet, creating a loud noise and a flash of light. Bishop, who realized what had happened and concealed the gun as soon as the incident happened, he then put it back in his holster and walked away from the scene, raising his hands in the air as if nothing had happened. However, something had happened. The bullet had hit a man named Thomas Reddington, who was sitting at a nearby table. Reddington felt a sharp pain in his lower leg and saw blood gushing out of a wound. He had been shot by Bishop's gun, and his artery had been severed. He was rushed to the hospital where he received treatment for his injury. Luckily, he survived the incident, but he was left with a scar and a trauma. The incident also triggered a police investigation, as Bishop had violated the law by carrying a concealed weapon without a permit. He was taken into custody and questioned by the authorities. He was later released to an FBI supervisor who took over the case. Bishop faced serious charges of second-degree assault, which could have landed him in prison for up to 16 years. However, he managed to avoid this fate by striking a deal with the prosecutor. Prosecutor. In November 2018, Bishop pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of third-degree assault, which was a misdemeanor. He accepted responsibility for his actions and apologized to Reddington in court. He was sentenced to two years of probation, which meant that he had to follow certain rules and report to a probation officer. He also had to pay a fine of $1,200 and provide financial compensation to Reddington for his medical expenses and emotional distress. Bishop's career as an FBI agent was also affected by the incident, as he was suspended and later fired from his position. Bishop reportedly apologized to the victim in court, saying he's extremely sorry for everything he's gone through. My whole goal in life is to care, protect, and serve people, Bishop said in court. I never expected the result of my actions to lead to something like this. Also, according to the Post, Reddington said he didn't believe Bishop should go to jail in court, but just hoped he doesn't carry a gun for a long time, according to the Post. Reddington's attorney, Bill Marlin, did not provide an immediate response to the request for comment. However, he later communicated with The Guardian, sharing that a prosecutor had relayed the news of Chase Bishop's termination from the FBI in the wake of the incident. It's important to understand that the FBI generally refrains from disclosing specific details regarding personnel matters, leaving many to speculate about the exact circumstances that led to Bishop's dismissal. In addition to the legal and professional consequences faced by Bishop, Reddington shed light on the significant impact the injury has had on his life. He opened up about the enduring chronic pain that serves as a constant reminder of that fateful night at the Denver bar. Beyond the DUI physical suffering, Reddington's ordeal took a heavy toll on his livelihood. He lost his job at an Amazon warehouse as a result of his injury. The financial and emotional burden of such a loss cannot be understated, further compounding the challenges he faces in his path to recovery. Moreover, Reddington candidly expressed the fear that he may never regain the ability to run again. This profound shift in his physical capabilities carries not only physical limitations, but also psychological and emotional strains. The loss of mobility and the activities once taken for granted can be deeply disheartening and emotionally taxing. I have done months of physical therapy, he said. I have sought counseling. However, being in public, especially seeing law enforcement with guns, makes me very uncomfortable. Despite all this, Reddington said he holds no personal grudge against Mr. Bishop. He said, I've done stupid things at bars to impress girls, too. Matthew Lowry. An FBI agent who became the very thing he was hunting. A drug offender, the heroin he busted others for, proving too great a temptation for himself. He went spiraling into addiction and allowed so many he had a hand in arresting to go free.
Matthew Lowry's lifelong aspiration had always been a career in law enforcement. From his earliest memories, he would eagerly don a mini police uniform, mimicking the uniformed heroes who patrolled his quiet rural neighborhood in Prince George's County, Maryland. His heart would race with joy as his father, a dedicated police officer, occasionally illuminated their home with the flashing lights of his patrol car, creating lasting impressions that fueled Matthew's dreams. Years later, Matthew's childhood dreams materialized when he earned a coveted position as an FBI agent. His primary mission was to tackle major drug cases that plagued communities across the nation. His journey seemed like a realization of all those youthful fantasies, but little did anyone know the darkness that lurked beneath the surface. Unfortunately, Matthew's life would take a tragic and unexpected turn. In March 2015, he stood before the court and confessed to a staggering 64 criminal charges. The shocking truth was that he had systematically stolen nearly two kilograms of heroin from the evidence collected in the very drug cases he was assigned to investigate. What led to this drastic downfall? It was a path paved with desperation, rooted in an addiction that had its origins in prescribed painkillers. The once dedicated agent had succumbed to the clutches of addiction, siphoning off portions of seized narcotics to feed his insatiable cravings. But his transgressions didn't end there. He resorted to desperate measures to conceal his crimes. Matthew began mixing the stolen drugs with innocent-looking substances like protein powder and laxatives, weaving an intricate web of deceit to cover his tracks. I knew what I was doing was wrong, Lowry told NBC News Kate Snow, but there's also that side of me that knows what's gonna happen if I don't use that day. What's gonna happen the next couple days if, if I stop taking or if I stop using heroin? I know what's gonna happen. According to him, withdrawals were agony, he said. You're sick and you're throwing up. You just never know when it's gonna end. Matthew Lowry's descent from being a dedicated FBI agent to struggling with drug addiction began in a way that mirrors the tragic stories of many individuals caught in the grip of opioids. It all started when he was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, a painful inflammatory bowel disease, and was prescribed the opioid painkiller hydrocodone to manage his excruciating pain. Initially, the medication served its intended purpose, providing relief and improving Lowry's quality of life. However, as is often the case with prescription opioids, the line between pain relief and dependency can blur. Over time, Lowry found himself relying on hydrocodone more frequently, his body and mind becoming increasingly dependent on the drug's effects. What began began as a legitimate medical treatment soon evolved into a full-blown addiction. The turning point in Lowry's life came when his prescribing doctor suddenly disappeared, leaving him without a legitimate source of hydrocodone. The abrupt cessation of the medication left Lowry in a state of withdrawal, facing not only the resurgence of his painful condition, but also the onset of severe cravings and desperation. In this vulnerable state, he made a fateful decision to turn to a more readily available and dangerous alternative, heroin. As a member of the FBI Cross-Border Task Force, task with investigating drug sales and handling evidence related to narcotics cases, Lowry had direct access to seized drugs, including heroin. This access made it tragically easy for him to acquire the illicit substance and fuel his growing addiction. It was in the confines of his FBI vehicle in the year 2013 that Lowry first turned to heroin. Withdrawing from the prescribed painkillers and desperate to alleviate the sickness that accompanied withdrawal, he made the decision to snort heroin, hoping it would provide temporary relief and buy him some time to to figure out his next steps. Within a couple minutes, all those withdrawals and all those feelings, it just goes away, he said. I was thinking, okay, this is something. No one will ever know about this. This is just something that, all right, I just need to get through today, and then I'll deal with tomorrow later. However, as time passed, he found himself taking the drugs more frequently, chasing the fleeting relief they offered. Slowly but steadily, he developed a dependence on opioids, a dependency that would soon spiral out of control. Soon, though, heroin became a daily necessity for him, not to experience a high, but just to feel normal. He knew he should stop, but he kept postponing it, waiting for a better time, perhaps when his wife and child were away for a weekend, or when he could take a week off from work. It was in part sheer luck that he hadn't been subjected to a random drug test between 2013 and 2014, which would have exposed his secret. This tragic story reflects a broader trend in the United States, where individuals who initially rely on prescription opioids often end up turning to heroin. Both types of drugs affect the brain and body in similar ways, but heroin tends to be cheaper and more readily available making it an enticing, albeit dangerous, alternative. According to the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the use of heroin among young people surged from 122,000 individuals in 2002 to 272,000 in 2012, highlighting the alarming scale of the opioid epidemic. Before his life took this dark turn, Lowry's career appeared to be on a promising trajectory. 
He achieved honors and graduated from the University of Maryland in just three years at the young age of 20. His passion for law enforcement led him to apply to the FBI where he was accepted and he began working on surveillance cases. In 2009, he was admitted to the FBI Academy, a significant milestone. Later, he joined the Cross-Border Task Force, a specialized unit that operated along the borders of Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, tackling complex cases and contributing to the fight against drug-related crimes. He ended up pleading guilty to 20 counts of obstruction of justice, 18 counts of falsification of records, 13 counts of conversion of property, and 13 counts of possession of heroin, and was eventually sentenced to three years in prison. In court, Lowry shed tears and offered his apologies to his family, as reported by NBC Washington. His father, a retired police commander, also wept and appealed to the judge for leniency. Although federal sentencing guidelines recommended a prison term of seven to nine years, U.S. District Court Judge Thomas Hogan was influenced by mitigating factors, particularly the nature of Lowry's addiction. As part of the sentencing, U.S. District Court Judge Thomas F. Hogan handed down a three-year prison sentence. Additionally, Lowry was ordered to serve two years of supervised release upon his release from prison and to pay a $15,000 fine, as stated by the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. The tragic tale of Matthew Lowry serves as a stark reminder of the harrowing consequences that addiction can impose upon even the most promising and dedicated individuals individuals. His story sheds light on the complexities of human frailty, leaving us with questions about the lengths one might go to in the throes of addiction and the ultimate cost of such choices. John Connolly. The case of a former FBI agent linked to mobster James Whitey Bulger was back in a Florida appeals court today. Judges are reconsidering John Connolly's second-degree murder conviction. His attorney says he should be freed because he was improperly found guilty and wrongly sentenced. John Connolly found himself mired in controversy as a disgraced FBI agent who joined forces with one of Boston's most infamous criminals, Whitey Bulger, in a bid to advance his own career. This collaboration unfolded as part of a complex and controversial case that entailed corruption, murder, and shed light on the intricate dynamics between the FBI and the Irish mob. Although Connolly was convicted initially in 2011, but in 2014, the court overturned his conviction citing the expiration of the statute of limitations, as he had not personally carried or used a firearm during the criminal activities. However, the question remains, how did John Connolly land himself in trouble? The genesis of Connolly's troubles can be traced back to the unexpected alliance he formed with Whitey Bulger, the infamous leader of Boston's Winter Hill Gang. Their partnership allowed Connolly to gain access to valuable insider information regarding Bulger's rivals in the Mafia, setting in motion a sequence of events that would ultimately lead to Connolly's downfall and legal troubles. The arrangement was seemingly straightforward. Bulger would provide Connolly with valuable information about rival gang members, while Connolly, in turn, would shield Bulger from prosecution for his own criminal activities by alerting him to any ongoing investigations. For over a decade, this arrangement worked seamlessly, allowing Bulger to steadily expand his criminal empire and ascend to the pinnacle of Boston's Irish mob. The benefits of the deal were mutual, as both Connolly and Bulger reaped rewards. Connolly was paid huge sums, and Bulger's rivals being removed from the streets reduced competition, particularly in the illicit drug trade. Consequently, Bulger, along with his partner Stephen Flemmy, was able to establish a drug empire, bolstering the power and influence of the Winter Hill Gang. With Connolly's protection, Bulger essentially evaded justice, even in cases involving murder and other serious crimes. In 1990, John Connolly concluded his 22-year tenure as an FBI agent. This retirement marked the end of Whitey Bulger's status as an informant, and by 1995, the FBI had brought charges against Bulger for racketeering and extortion. The once symbiotic relationship between a criminal and a law enforcement agent had soured, and justice was beginning to catch up to them. By 1998, revelations regarding John Connolly's covert alliance with Whitey Bulger began to surface. He faced his initial federal indictments the following year, and in 2002, he was found guilty on multiple counts, including racketeering, obstruction of justice, and lying to an FBI agent. These charges stemmed from Connolly's actions in tipping off Bulger and Flemmy before their 1995 arrests, advising them to flee and evade capture. Subsequently, Connolly provided false information to an FBI agent regarding his role in these events. As a consequence, he was convicted in 2002 and sentenced to serve 10 years in prison, but the worst was yet to come. John Connolly faced his most severe charges in 2008 when he was convicted of second-degree murder. The case revolved around a disturbing incident where Connolly had leaked information to Whitey Bulger, leading the notorious mobster to orchestrate the killing of a man
man named John Callahan. John Callahan, the former president of World Jaya Lai, held information that could potentially implicate Bulger in a previous murder involving another executive from World Jaya Lai. Connolly's leak of this crucial tip to Bulger prompted the mob boss to order a hit on Callahan as a means to safeguard himself from potential legal consequences. Tragically, John Callahan met a grim fate at the hands of John Martirano, who left Callahan's lifeless body in the trunk of a Cadillac parked at Miami International Airport. This gruesome murder was a significant factor in Connolly's conviction for second-degree murder. Prosecutors asserted that John Callahan met his demise on the orders of Whitey Bulger and Stephen Flemmy, driven by information provided by John Connolly. Connolly had informed them that the FBI was investigating Callahan's connections to the Winter Hill Gang, a component of the ongoing investigation into the murder of Roger Wheeler, who had been killed by John Martirano in May 1981. During the trial, key testimonies from Bulger Associates Flemmy, Martirano, and Kevin Weeks painted a vivid picture of Connolly's deep-seated ties to Bulger and Flemmy. Flemmy, in particular, disclosed that he and Bulger had paid Connolly a substantial sum of $235,000 over the years. Their payments to Connolly dwindled in the late 1980s as his conspicuous luxury purchases, including a boat, began drawing unwanted attention. In the courtroom, Connolly, then 68, adamantly denied any involvement in the murder, expressing his deep sorrow to the family of the slain businessman John Callahan, saying, It's heartbreaking to hear what happened to your father and to your husband. My heart is broken when I hear what you say. During a vigorous cross-examination, Connolly elaborated that cultivating relationships with criminals and gaining their trust was an integral aspect of his role. His defense attorney contended, He did what the FBI wanted wanted him to do, and now all of a sudden, he's being held accountable for all these heinous acts. John Connolly received an additional 40-year prison sentence for his involvement in the murder. The judge agreed with the prosecutor's argument that Connolly had abused his badge and warranted more than the minimum 30-year sentence. This state sentence of 40 years was to be served consecutively with his previous 10-year federal sentence. Connolly adamantly maintained his innocence, stating, I did not commit these crimes I was charged with. I never sold my badge. I never took anybody's money. I never caused anybody to be hurt, at least not knowingly, and I never would. Would. However, his denial did not prevent his incarceration. He remained in prison until May 28, 2014, when a panel of Florida's 3rd District Court of Appeal voted 2-1 to overturn Connolly's murder conviction. They argued that since Connolly did not carry or discharge the gun that was used to kill John Callahan in South Florida, it was not justifiable to convict him of murder. Subsequently, on July 29, 2015, the full court, sitting on bank, reinstated Connolly's murder conviction by a 6-4 vote, asserting that the conviction was legally valid, even though Connolly was on Cape Cod when John Martirano murdered Callahan. According to Florida's sentencing guidelines, Connolly had to serve at least one-third of his sentence before becoming eligible for parole. Connolly was ultimately granted parole from a Florida prison in 2021, without objection from John Callahan's widow. This decision came after prison authorities learned of his grave illness and the possibility that he had only a year left to live. He returned to Massachusetts, but will remain under supervision until 2047. Robert Fitzpatrick. Man who claimed to be one of the good guys in the Whitey Bulger case is facing years behind bars. Former FBI agent Robert Fitzpatrick accused of lying under oath. Robert Fitzpatrick, the former assistant special agent in charge, ASAC, of the FBI's Boston office, was sentenced to two years of probation for repeatedly lying during the 2013 murder and racketeering trial of notorious Boston mobster Whitey Bulger. During Bulger's 2013 trial, Fitzpatrick testified that he had made efforts to terminate the FBI's corrupt association with Bulger, who had been shielded from prosecution by agents who viewed him as a valuable informant on the New England mob. Fitzpatrick's testimony also included claims that he had discovered the rifle used in the assassination of civil rights activist Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968, and that he had been later assigned to Boston for a special mission to address significant issues there. Prosecutors later revealed that Robert Fitzpatrick, during his testimony at Whitey Bulger's high-profile trial in Boston, lied about his attempts to close Bulger as an informant and exaggerated his professional achievements, partly as a promotional tactic for a book he co-authored titled Betrayal, 
Whitey Bulger and the FBI agent who fought to bring him down. As part of his guilty plea, Fitzpatrick acknowledged that he had lied when he testified during Bulger's trial, that he had tried to end Bulger's FBI informant status and target him for prosecution, but was overruled by higher FBI authorities. He pleaded guilty to six counts each of perjury and obstruction of justice. These counts encompassed fabrications related to his assignment to Boston in 1980, Bulger's denial of being an informant, his efforts to close Bulger as an FBI informant, his demotion as ASAC, the arrest of mob boss Gennaro Angiulo, and the recovery of the rifle used in the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., Fitzpatrick, had been peddling the same. Lies for nearly two decades, Assistant U.S. Attorney Zachary Hafer told the judge. U.S. Attorney Carmen M. Ortiz also said, Mr. Fitzpatrick's plea of guilty on all counts makes clear that there are consequences to lying in federal court. In this case, the fact that the defendant was a high-ranking former law enforcement official who falsely held himself out as a whistleblower who tried to end the FBI's corrupt relationship with Bulger made his conduct even more egregious. Ronald G. Gardella, special agent in charge of the Department of Justice Office of Inspector General's New York Field Office, also made a comment saying, for a former senior FBI official to lie under oath while testifying in a prosecution related to the FBI's corrupt relationship with a violent criminal is egregious and can erode the public's trust trust in the judicial system. When allegations of this kind arise, it is critical that they be fully investigated so the public and juries can have confidence that when witnesses take the stand, they are fully aware of the stakes for not telling the truth. In the 1970s and 1980s, Whitey Bulger, the leader of the Winter Hill Gang, was convicted of 11 murders, either directly or through his orders, and is currently serving a life sentence. While Robert Fitzpatrick reached a plea agreement that spared him from imprisonment, under the agreement he received a two-year probation sentence. This decision was was based on Fitzpatrick's lack of a prior criminal record, his acknowledgement of responsibility for his crimes, and his poor health, including conditions like cancer, kidney disease, and diabetes. Fitzpatrick was also ordered to pay a $12,500 fine. His plea agreement was instrumental in securing this sentence, as he could have faced a maximum prison term of over seven years without it. According to the judge, Judge Saylor expressed his acceptance of the plea deal with some reservations and misgivings. He found Fitzpatrick's actions particularly troubling due to his back background as a former law enforcement official who had lied during a murder trial. After the hearing, Fitzpatrick left the courthouse quickly, expressing his desire to move forward with his life. If you enjoyed this video, then you should click on any of the cards on your screen for more videos like this.